and I'd never forget Kilmeena. It was like the black hole of Calcutta. It was a awful, gloomy, dirty looking place. We were put into different shelters there, and they were musty and didn't seem to have any air. I heard one of the girls next door breaking a window, and I did the same to my place, and we had some air. Dear Bridie, my jail experience is written in fire across my brain, never to be effaced. Yours truly, Polly, North Dublin Union, 1923. This is a story that crosses the social divide, that embraced women from all walks of life. These women had come of age in an Ireland that had undergone change, from being a stronghold of the British Empire to organized rebellion and civil war. They faced death in the fighting and later in prison hunger strikes. Like their male counterparts, they were willing to die for Ireland, yet their names are not remembered. Their political involvement was something those closest to them often preferred to forget. By taking part in the struggle for independence, they overcame enormous prejudice, not just from their male military colleagues, but from their fellow countrymen and women. They were Ireland's secret army, and their story began at the turn of the century. working age was eight years old. Women did not have the right to vote and 50% of them remained unmarried. Participation in public life was frowned upon by the Catholic Church and women were excluded from political parties and cultural societies. There was one woman who rose above the restrictions of the time, Maud Gaughan. Maud Gaughan was already a well-known anti-British activist. When she tried to gain membership of the National Land League, she was told it was an open organization in which the ladies would not take part. I think it was Parnell who said, England's gifts to Ireland were workhouses, prisons, and lunatic asylums. The evictions that I saw in 1885 changed the whole course of my life, transforming me from a carefree society girl into a woman of set purpose. I was determined to do my share to free Ireland from the British Empire. The wholesale destruction of the little houses of the people by battering rams was going on all over the country. 360,000 people were evicted from their little homes and the Queen Victoria. Stones and boiling water were no match for guns. Maud Gaughan was not an Irish woman by birth. She had come to Ireland as a child when her father, a captain in the British Army, was posted here. After fleeing to France to avoid arrest for her activities, she had published a broadsheet about colonial repression and the loss of Irish identity. Like many creative and political thinkers of her era, she believed that the mindset of Ireland had to change. The Celtic revival had begun. The Celtic Literary Society, founded by Willie Rooney, 
like all political organizations of those days, excluded women from membership. But they invited me to lecture for them. So I used the opportunity of asking if they really thought Mother Ireland strong enough to go into battle with one arm tied behind her back, which was what this exclusion of women from political life meant, and suggested that they should invite their sisters and sweethearts to meet me in their room in Abbey Street, and we would form a woman's organization for national independence. A few days after, I met some 14 sisters and sweethearts, all young, inexperienced in political work, but all loving Ireland and eager to work for her. What can we do? England is preventing our language and our history being taught in the schools. We could start free classes to teach the children subjects forbidden in the schools. English is trying to get Irishmen to enlist in her army. We could start an anti-recruiting campaign. Before a year was out, we had three centers in Dublin, teaching history, Irish, music, and dancing. That was how Inenia Nahairn started. As well as the political work, Miss Gunn always wanted the social side of things attended to. Well, at that time, there was great poverty in Dublin because a working man working anything up to 60 hours, he earned 14 or 15 shillings a week and had to keep a family on that. And she got the idea in France for school dinners. It was a dinner of stew and vegetables and potatoes, hot. They cooked it and sent it up in cauldrons in a little class that we heard to the school. And the teachers and we all, the members of Anini, went up and served the children. We forbid the word charity to be used in connection with them. And each child was expected to pay a penny, but no one knew whether the child next to them had or had not the penny. Ireland in 1900 was part of the British Empire, with all the emblems that that entailed. The British military patrolled the capital, occupying one side of O'Connell Street, the GPO side. They dazzled young women in their military uniforms. Inyinia Naharan set about dissuading young girls from stepping out with British soldiers. They also campaigned against local boys joining the occupying army. Our anti-enlisting campaign was so successful that it brought Queen Victoria to Ireland to stimulate recruiting, which obliged us to start another campaign to stop official welcomes to English royal visitors. We held a great demonstrations, but failed to prevent Queen Victoria receiving the keys of the city of Dublin. But we succeeded in preventing Edward VII receiving them when he visited Dublin after his coronation. Maud Gaughan had written an article on Queen Victoria called The Famine Queen. The day before Victoria's arrival in Dublin, it was published in The United Irishman. The paper was seized and Maud Gaughan was removed with physical force. On the day before the arrival of King Edward, Gaughan was busy leafleting the streets again. When she arrived home, she was so disgusted with her neighbor's display of Union Jacks and bunting that she broke a broom and made her own flag. Another young woman disgusted by the display of flunkyism was 19-year-old Helena Maloney. That evening, she decided to join Inina Naharan. So I went down in 1903 to their offices in Pierce Street and I found them closed, but on the door was um, a message in pencil, read on Maud Gunn's house. On the door was um, a message in pencil, read on Maud Gunn's house, Colson Avenue, come up, all of you. So I at once went up to Colson Avenue in the tram, 
And there I saw, at her house, a, a row of policemen looking very threateningly. The, the lawn, the little lawn, was filled with the members of the Nini, all girls. And she had had a black flag out. There was a, a visit of some loyal function going on in the city at the time. And it was a counterblast to the decorations of Union Jacks and so on. So I went in to the lawn, I was admitted, but I, they, I was unknown to them, you see. And the girls looked at me very suspiciously. Despite their suspicions, Helena persisted, going on to become a central figure in Hanina and Heron. Later, Helena Maloney recalled, I walked home on air, really believing I was a member of the mystical army of Ireland. And it was into the Nini that you brought the Countess Markovitz. Yes. That was her initiation. Yes, that the, was her initiation. Into the national movement. I got the idea of starting a woman's paper. And I saw her name amongst a list of people who had attended a Sinn Féin meeting in the Mansion House, uh, Arthur Griffith's organization. And I saw her name, and being a woman, I, I wrote to her at once and asked her, would she come and help on the Banner Heron, our little monthly journal, which was a penny monthly, um, called Banner Heron, Woman of Ireland. It was an odd kind of woman's paper, a funny hodgepodge of blood and thunder, high thinking and homemade brown bread. As Helena Maloney would later describe, a mixture of guns and chiffon. It is very unpleasant work killing slugs and snails, but let us not be daunted. A good nationalist should look upon slugs in the garden much in the same way as she looks on the British in Ireland. You had some distinguished contributors to it. You had Susan Mitchell, who was an assistant yes. to the AE, wrote, Raise from your knees, O daughters, raise. Yes, your right. mother still is young and fair. Let the world look into your eyes and see her beauty shining there. Grant of that beauty but one gleam. Heroes shall rise on every hill. Today shall be as yesterday. The red blood burns in Ireland still. The young working girls who joined in Nina were defying the norms of the day and risking their livelihoods by joining a nationalist organization. Membership was considered to be a treasonable activity for which they could be discharged immediately. Irish women first became involved in the labour movement in 1911, when 3,000 women at Jacob's factory went on strike for better wages. They won and set up the Irish Women's Workers' Union. In the great lockout of 1913, the entire membership of the Women's Workers' Union stayed out on strike for six months. James Connolly took over the Irish Trade and General Workers' Union and set up the Irish Citizen Army to protect workers against the police brutality. Countess Markovitch, already involved in the struggle to overthrow British rule, joined the Irish Citizen Army. And with her flair for military organization and knowledge of firearms, she was given high rank. James Connolly welcomed women into the ranks on equal terms with the men. Connolly was very, he was a good suffragist himself, you know. If a girl could handle a gun, she was given a gun. If a man could cook a meal, he was expected to cook it and not feel in any way degraded by it. Everyone had to do whatever their cap wherever their capability lay to do that work for Ireland's sake. The third Home Rule Bill in 1912 promised a greater level of self-government. It caused an upsurge in nationalist activity. The North galvanized in opposition to Home Rule, forming the Ulster Volunteer Force. Over 3,000 women joined. Prompted by the Northern example, 
the Irish Nationalist Volunteer Force was set up in Dublin. At their inaugural meeting in 1913, President Owen McNeill promised there would be work for the women. But the women were not content to take on a supporting role to the men. And Cumann the Mon was set up in April 1914 as a militant and extremist movement gearing itself for war. When Cumann the Mon first marched, they were pelted with mud and ridiculed. We are not the handmaidens or camp followers of the volunteers. We are their allies. The aims of Cumann the Mon were to advance the cause of Irish liberty and to assist in arming a body of Irish men. With Markovich as president, Cumann the Mon set up the Defence of Ireland Fund to raise money to buy arms. It was the idea of the Honourable Mary Spring Rice to smuggle arms in from Germany with the help of Erskine Childers and his wife Molly. They used Childers' yacht, the Asgard. In July 1914, after a 19-day voyage, they landed 900 rifles and 29,000 rounds of ammunition at Hoth, County Dublin. Britain was at war at the end of August 1914, and the Home Rule Bill was postponed once again. John Redmond, leader of the Home Rule Party, called on the volunteers to fight for Britain in the Great War. This caused a split amongst the volunteers. The majority supported Redmond and went to fight for Britain. Common and Morn were opposed to fighting for Britain and no branch of the organization supported Redmond. They issued the statement at the convention of 1914. We came into being to advance the cause of Irish liberty. We feel bound to make the pronouncement that to urge or encourage Irish volunteers to enlist in the British Army cannot, under any circumstances, be regarded as consistent with our work. Donovan Ross's funeral was the biggest nationalist demonstration Ireland had seen in years. The funeral committee represented all the nationalist groups, and for the first time, Common Amon was included. The nationalist movement had a new generation of inspired and committed men and women. They were setting the stage for a rebellion against Britain. At the graveside, Patrick Pearce made his famous speech stating that Ireland on free would never be at peace. Women were also impatient for Irish freedom. Common Amon was growing in force. By 1915, there were more than 60 branches in Ireland. Membership had doubled. Along with their peers in the Irish Citizen Army and the Irish Volunteers, Common de Mon was gearing up for a strike against Britain. Many women worked from the basement of Liberty Hall, which had become an ammunition store. Connolly had a scheme 
which I think worked very well. There was a very big blackboard outside, about six feet by three, outside the front door of Liberty Hall, on which every week and every Saturday there were flamboyant notices chalked. Assemble tomorrow, full equipment for an attack on Wellington Barracks. And another week it would be attack on some other barracks. These are all fictitious. We went on route marches. We didn't make any attack anywhere. But I said one day to Connolly, I said, why do you put out these notices that, that don't mean anything, only turning the eyes of the police on us? And he smiled and said, ah, did you never hear the story of Wolf, Wolf, Wolf? For two weeks leading up to Easter, Helena Maloney and her co-worker, Ginny Shanahan, slept in Liberty Hall every night. In their room, they made the first tricolors for the rising. According to Maloney, we didn't get definite instructions of the rising. Our little group was on the alert the whole time. It was on the Saturday afternoon before Easter that we left Belfast to go to Tyrone. And then a messenger came and said they were looking for Miss Connolly. I was met by two men who told me they were from Dublin. They told me that there would be no fighting in Tyrone. So I decided I had no choice. I was to go on to Dublin if there was no fighting in Tyrone. What happened to Nora Connolly that Saturday morning was echoed all over the country. The Irish Republican Brotherhood, now known as the Military Council under Patrick Pearce, had forged a document to dupe MacNeil into authorizing a rising. That Saturday, with just one day to go before the planned rising, MacNeil had discovered the document was a forgery and sent out orders cancelling all marches, parades and maneuvers. We arrived in Dublin about six o'clock in the morning and I walked over to Liberty Hall and when I went in there was my father on a little cot in the middle of the room. He wasn't asleep. He turned and he looked at me. He said, what are you doing here, Nora? So I told him what had happened and I said to him, Daddy, what does it mean? We're not going to fight. And he turned to me and two big tears rolled down his cheeks. He says, if we don't fight, Nora, we can only pray for an earthquake to come and swallow us and our shame. MacNeil's actions would overshadow all that followed. The discussions that took place in Liberty Hall were heartbreaking, with many of the volunteers and Irish Citizen Army saying that they would fight single-handed if necessary. The military council decided to go ahead with the rising and sent out couriers countermanding MacNeil's orders. Many of the couriers were women. Nora Connolly returned to Belfast with the message that the rising would go ahead on Easter Monday. But for many, the new order would come too late, for they had already demobilized. The news was rushed about. The volunteers had taken the GPO. They were in possession of several other places in the city. It was easy enough to get down O'Connor Street still, and I made my way to the GPO and asked the volunteer on guard to let me in to speak to Padraig Pierce, who was the only one of the leaders that I knew personally. I was brought to Pierce and had the temerity to tell him that I thought the rebellion was very wrong, as it would certainly fail but that I wished to be there if there was going to be anything doing. The first shot was fired at Dublin Castle. Helena Maloney was there with a party of nine girls from the Irish Citizen Army. Under the command of John Connolly, they took over the city hall. Later, they would be joined by the chief medical officer with the Irish Citizen Army, Dr. Kathleen Lynn. At both one of them, we were on the roof. Several men and I and some girls and uh, John Connolly and he was struck 
bullet was firing, you see, from the castle and from the roof, the houses opposite. And by that time, Dr. Lynn had arrived downstairs, and she came up, and she said, I'm afraid he's going. So he lasted a couple of minutes. I said a prayer into his ear as he went, and he was, he was dead. When carrying dispatches to the GPO, I saw the charge of the 5th Lancers down O'Connell Street, and they repulsed by fire from the GPO garrison. I also saw the hoisting of the tricolour on the GPO. On my return from the GPO, I saw Madame Markovics and William Partridge turn back a column of British soldiers who were advancing down Harcourt Street. Madame had shot the two officers at the head of the column. Monday night we spent in Stevens Green. On Tuesday morning, we realised that our position was untenable, as British troops had succeeded in gaining possession of the Shelburne Hotel and were firing on us from the roof. Before we left the green, we lost one of our men, James Fox, who a few moments before had been singing, wrapped the green flag around me, boys. We then evacuated the green and took possession of the College of Surgeons. Margaret Skinner, a 23-year-old school teacher from Glasgow, was part of the 138-strong Stevens Green Battalion. A friend, Countess Markovich, was second in command under Michael Mallon. Over 200 women took part in the rising, stationed at all major outposts in the city, except Boland's Mill. Well, now, as everybody knows by this time, in Boland's Mills, there were no coming among, although they had waited on Mount Street Bridge to be called, and de Valera didn't approve of having girls from, I think he didn't want to put them in danger, and so there were no girls there, no women of any kind. Towards nightfall, they, they attacked the, the windows at the back of the city hall, which led out of the castle yard. There was an attack on that, and they evidently got in through one of the lower windows because we heard a call, surrender. And that was repeated because the plaster was falling in showers from the roof as a result of the firing on the city hall, you see. And, um, we were taken out one by one through the window at the back and taken prisoner. Fire raged through the city, and by Friday the GPO was in flames. Pierce called on the 40 women stationed there and asked them to leave. By about Thursday, the front of the GPO had been set on fire. On Friday evening, a party of about 12 of us, five or six girls, a handful of wounded men, of whom only one was unable to walk, were told to get out of the back of the GPO and make our way to Jervis Street Hospital. It must have been just about that time that the garrison, led by Pierce and the others, got out into Henry Street and over to Moore Street. Three women chose to remain with the leaders of the Rising, Julia Grennan, Elizabeth O'Farrell, and Winnie Carney. With the wounded James Connolly on a stretcher, they made their way through the blaze to a little house on Moore Street. 230 innocent civilians, including 28 children, had been killed in the fighting. On Friday night, Sean McDermott asked Elizabeth O'Farrell to make a white flag. Later, it was decided that she would deliver the surrender note. I left the house with a verbal message from Commandant Pierce to the commander of the British forces to the effect that he wished to treat with them. I waved the small white flag which I carried and the military ceased firing. The next day, at 3.30, she stood by Patrick Pierce's side while he surrendered. In photographs of that surrender, Elizabeth O'Farrell was literally airbrushed out. Only her feet can be seen next to Pierce's. The leaders of the Rising were marched away, leaving Elizabeth O'Farrell alone to take the surrender note to the rest of the garrisons. Heavy fire still raged through the city, and her journey would take her two days. She was turned away at some of the outposts, as the men were not prepared to take the note of surrender from a woman. 
We were all marched under military escort to Richmond Barracks. The girls were singing all the time amidst the insults of the soldiers and the people along the route. We never had the British to protect us before. But luckily, the soldiers guarded us very heavily. Because when the gates were opened and we were marched out, there were such shrieks of hatred. Never did I see such savage women. A lot of it seemed to be directed against the Countess's breeches and putties. 77 women were among the prisoners that passed through Richmond Barracks. The women were then taken to Kilmainham Jail. The leaders of the Rising, including Countess Markovich, were court-martialed and sentenced to death. Most of the women were released after a week. Others were deported to England, where they were imprisoned or placed under house arrest. The Countess's sentence was later commuted to life in prison. There were also women imprisoned who had played no part in the Rising. Annie Higgins, Countess Plunkett, Nell Humphreys, Marie Perlose, Kathleen Brown, Odell Ryan. They were held for four months without trial. We were put into a disused wing, the women, and evidently all the other men who had surrendered in the meantime outside were brought in there, and the, the men were executed. The executed men. Were you there when they executed? And we were and heard it every morning from our cell. At it. I knew there was something sinister in the sound of those bullets. I knew I said to myself, they're shooting them, they're shooting the prisoners. Nellie Gifford, a young girl stationed at the College of Surgeons during the Rising, was now in prison. Her sister Muriel was married to Thomas McDonough, one of the leaders sentenced to death. Her other sister Grace was the fiancé of Joseph Plunkett, also to be executed. I was staying with my sister Muriel at the time. She was Tom McDonough's wife and she was alone with the two children. I remember going to get the papers and there was the news that Patrick Pierce and Tom had been executed. The next morning, although we'd been up all night, I woke as if been pulled out of the bed by an unforeseen force. I had no notion what I was doing, except I was being pulled on. I went then to Kilmainham to see Joe. After five hours, I was let in to see him. The prison chaplain married us. I was brought in and put in front of the altar. Then Joe was brought down the steps and the cuffs were taken off him. And the chaplain went on with the ceremony. I was not alone with him, not for one minute. I had no private conversation with him at all. When we got into my father, he said, well, Lily, he said, I suppose you know what this means. Oh, no, not that, he said, yes, Lily. She broke down then and she said, your beautiful life, James. He says, your beautiful life. And he said, wasn't it full life, Lillian? Isn't this a good end? And she broke, but she still cried. So he says, look, Lily, please don't cry. He says, you'll unman me. So she tried to control herself. I was trying to control myself, too. And we were there. I talked about it. Things. He was trying to plan her life for him after he was gone, and then they told us time was up and we'd have to go. He was to, he was to be shot at dawn. You see. Well, we heard of the executions. And of course, that horrified people because we, in, in every chapter of Irish history, we should be accustomed to hearing of ruthless acts.
But uh, uh, this was another. If England wanted Ireland, why had she no kindness towards them? Why had she no kindness? And Maxwell, I think the first proclamation of the English in Ireland after the rising was directed at the widows of the men they had just executed. 78 volunteers had lost their lives during the rising and the number in turn reached 2,600 at its height. The families of these men were now destitute. Immediately after the rising, Mrs. Tom Clark had a thousand pounds in gold to look after the emergencies after the rising, the dependents and whatever need there was. But within a fortnight or three weeks of his execution, she had assembled a band of women to make the first movement to collect money. And money came in from all over the world in response. They, uh, they, they, they were able to help uh, those who had lost their relations. Common Amon risked arrest in collecting and administering these funds. When the men were released in the general amnesty of 1917, a network of nationalist Ireland had been put in place by the women. The women of the Rising who had been deported with the men had by now also been released, except Countess Markovich. It would take a further six months for her release in June 1917. She had spent almost a year in prison and had become an iconic figure. She returned to a very different Ireland. Come on the morn, the Irish Women Workers' Union and the Irish Citizen Army all came together with a single goal. The women were determined that the promise of equal opportunity and citizenship proclaimed in 1916 would be fulfilled. Four women were co-opted onto the executive of the new umbrella organization of Sinn Féin. In 1918, women over 30 with property gained the right to vote. Sinn Féin won a landslide victory in the general election of that year, and Countess Markovich became the first female parliamentarian in Europe. But all was not well in this victory. Out of the 75 seats Sinn Féin had won, 49 of the candidates were still in prison. By 1919, the War of Independence had begun. We were trained in first aid. We were trained to how to break a rifle or a revolver and, um, and close it again and how to keep them clean, how to mine them in for dumps. They had to be dumped. They were, well, they called them dumps, as uh, places of security where they could be kept. And um, there was wells in the pram that time. You don't even want to stuff hidden in the wells, the pram. That child slept on ammunition and everything, you know. Keen to gain American support, Nora Connolly, Margaret Skinner, and Hannah Sheehy Skeffington all went there. Skeffington was determined to tell the true story of 1916 and of how her pacifist husband had been shot in the Rising. She also secured a meeting with President Woodrow Wilson something Eamon de Valera had not managed to do in his months of American campaigning. Hannah Sheehy Skeffington was arrested on her return from America, along with many other activists, including Kathleen Clark, who had been taken from her sickbed, Countess Markovich and Maud Gon McBride. Maud Gon McBride had returned to Ireland after her husband, Major McBride, was executed in 1916. She was arrested while taking a British MP on a tour of the poverty-stricken areas in Dublin. 
her young son, Sean, ran after the Black Mariah as she was driven away for deportation. In 1919, women were in charge of the new alternative justice system set up by Dole Aaron. I went with a message to Countess Markovich's labor department. And somebody said, have you seen this? And I said, no. And they had this little oath printed. And I signed it. I, Mara Comfort, do solemnly swear that to the best of my knowledge and ability, I will support and defend the Irish Republic. The government of the Irish Republic, which is Dalaran, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. Early in 1920, the British changed all their policies. I was in Kumaraman, of course, and we were doing whatever we had to do in that organization. And uh, presently the Black and Tans arrived, and uh, life became extremely much different, I can assure you. But uh, the effect on lonely places in the country was really terribly sad. The Black and Tans became synonymous with violence. All nationalist organizations were banned, including Common Amon. But the women stood their ground, resisting constant raids, intimidations, shootings, and the burning of their homes and businesses. I don't think they could ever have managed without them. The men couldn't have. For instance, outside Mount Joy, when Kevin Barry was being executed, all come the men were kneeling down outside. You know, Kevin Barry was being hanged and he was only 18. And there was a great hue and cry and everybody thought there might be a reprieve on account of his youth. And everybody wished and hoped. And we went there at six o'clock in the morning. And at eight o'clock, Everybody's still hoping. The prison officer came out and he, he pinned a paper onto the gate of Mount Joy. And uh, there was a huge gasp from everybody. It said on the paper that he had been hanged and that the prison doctor had pronounced him dead. And we were, in, we were very, everybody was very upset. And we had, to, we had to take up the threads of our own lives at the same time. And we left the road to the armored cars with our guns all sticking out and our softly purring engines. Did you ever hear the engine of, a, of a, an armored car? It's a Rolls Royce and it, it just purrs. But it was in strong contrast to our outraged feelings. After two and a half years of war, the British were forced to negotiate, and a truce was called in July 1921. Not one woman was included in the committee to negotiate peace. The women who asked to take part were considered by de Valera to be too militant or too extremist. The treaty that was signed in 1921 gave Ireland the status of a free state. It was not the republic fought and died for in 1916. It was an extension of home rule and members of the Doyle would have to swear an oath of allegiance to the Crown. For the first time since 1900, the women's movement began to split. Those who favoured the treaty became known as Common Assertia. Common Amon's opposition to the treaty was overwhelming. They now became, as de Valera would later describe, the most unmanageable of revolutionaries. Civil war broke out. People that you trusted uh, implicitly before that you couldn't you couldn't trust them anymore it was to the normal time really ever after that you were never safe i used to be sent in dispatches to different places one time i was sent with a rifle when i got down to fleet street i i saw them people hiding in doorways and I hid in the doorway, and they were firing at one another from one end of the street to the other. So I was wondering what would happen if I was caught with my rifle. But I, you didn't mind being arrested or what had happened during those days. You did it all for Ireland. 
I was in jail some of the time, but there was a period when I was a, a, a driver for the IRA. I brought communications up to the northern border. I brought communications also down to the second southern division in uh, Rose Green County, Tipperary. And going into Rose Green in the night, one had to turn up the car's lights and blow the horn, because otherwise you get shot. I remember I got up to the top floor, to a cell in the top floor, and it was uh, marked out, I suppose, by some one of the main prisoners before the four courts. <laughs> and that was my cell. And Mary McSweeney and Mrs. Humphreys and Sheila Humphreys, they were moved uh, us to. So we were all in Kilmainham. And uh, it, it was a dreary place. Mary McSweeney a sister of Terence, who had died on hunger strike, was the first woman to resort to a hunger strike in the Civil War. When her sister Annie was refused permission to see her, she camped at the gates of the prison and went on her own hunger strike. At the end of April 1923, the governor of Kilmainham decided to remove some of the women prisoners to a workhouse called the North Dublin Union. The conditions in Kilmainham were so poor the women would have welcomed the move, but for their concern for the health of two of the hunger strikers, Mary McSweeney and Kate O'Callaghan. On the evening of April the 13th, military police began to forcibly remove women from the prison. It would take them five hours. After I'd been dragged from the railings, a great hand closed over my face, blinding and stifling me, and thrust me back down to the ground among trampling feet. I heard someone who saw it scream, and I wondered how Miss McSweeney could bear the noise. After that, I remember being carried by one or two men and flung down into the surgery to be searched. Dear Bridie, my jail experience is written in fire across my brain, never to be effaced. Yours truly, Polly, North Dublin Union, 1923. Bridie Halpin did try to efface the memory of prison at the end of the Civil War. Like many of the women who emerged from prison, she chose emigration. When she died in a New York apartment in the year 1988, there were no memories of her as a young girl. No one knew of her political life, of her hopes and dreams, until they found a suitcase under the bed. As each document was uncovered, an unknown bridey emerged. Each piece of paper, a personal memoir, a vignette weaving a portrait of a time and a person that had been forgotten. The last item that was uncovered was Bridie's jail journal. Dear Polly, Far better the grave of a rebel without cross, without stone, without name, than a treaty with treacherous England. Bridie Halpin, Kilmainham Jail, August 12th, 1923. It was a glorious war on account of the resistance of the wonderful courage of people and fighting men and their women under conditions of extraordinary difficulty and terrible repression. Well, people had to take risks, Jim. It was kind of, um, kind of, uh, you're in it, and you, you had to take respons responsibility. I think it made a great generation of people because everybody had to accept responsibility things very early on. If this generation knew exactly what was suffered in those days, now, they couldn't possibly but take note of it. 
Remember me is all I ask. And if remembrance proves a task, forget. Nora O'Sullivan, 1923. In Dublin's fair city Where the girls are so pretty I first laid my eyes on sweet Molly Malone As she wheeled her wheelbarrow Through the streets broad and narrow Crying cockles and mosses So oh.